And we're welcoming to the desk, Ryan Berg. Uh, you're going to be signing a book later on tonight. Book signing, a uh, big deal going on. Yeah, I am. I'm doing a signing and having a conversation with some folks uh, in Des Moines about LGBT youth homelessness and youth in foster care. This is a topic I had heard nothing about. Right. Uh, and uh, and it's very sad that this world exists. And, and uh, I guess tell folks a little bit about the background. Sure. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's a horribly unreported topic. Um, so... Um, we know that there have been great strides with the LGBT community within the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. The great things have been happening, uh, but unfortunately, with homeless youth and uh, youth in foster care, um, so you know it's it's not quite as great. Um, we have um, about 70 percent of youth in foster care uh, who are LGBT identified um, have talked about um, experiencing violence. 100% um, have experienced harassment and bullying. And 100%? Another, 100%. And 78% have had to be removed from their um, placement or run away because of hostility, <coughs> pardon me, due to their gender identity. And Ryan, you're from West Des Moines. I am. But you moved to New York City, and that's where you got a lot of the perspective uh, for, the, for right. the book here. Tell us what you did in New York City and how closely you worked with uh, many people from this community. Uh, sure. So the book chronicles my time working with LGBT youth in foster care. I would moved from uh, Iowa City to San Francisco, San Francisco. Francisco to Italy, Italy to New York, um, primarily to do theater, and then I ended up getting involved with foster care because I really wanted to be a part of something greater than myself. Had no idea what was going on in this community and, and, and the struggles and challenges that they faced. Um, I was a residential counselor and then I was a case manager working with these young people. So I was really tasked with helping them move forward in their lives, face some of the challenges and barriers, and hopefully overcome some of those barriers. How did they get in the place in most cases where they were homeless to begin with? Homelessness, predictors of homelessness are varied. Um, it can be anything from um, generational poverty with families, it can be institutional racism, um, it can be mental health issues or drug addiction uh, issues within the family. Yeah. Uh, with this particular population, it's really around family rejection. Mm -hmm. It's family saying, um, mm -hmm. we don't accept you for who you are, and then they end up on the street. And family rejection is the number one cause of LGBT youth entering into the juvenile detention system as well. Mm -hmm. So it is a pipeline uh, into uh, not only homelessness, but then incarceration as well. And now, then the problem is people don't they don't want to foster these children, unfortunately, because uh, because of their identification. Right. So one of the biggest issues across the country with foster care is there isn't a cultural competency training for foster parents and also service workers around these issues so we can create affirming uh, practices and services and supports for these young people. So many young people will go into foster care. They don't want to identify themselves as LGBT because they're afraid of discrimination, they're afraid of violence, and they're afraid of rejection, which is re-traumatizing them uh, in, as a result. So um, the book really talks about how we should have services available um, and uh, training for not only foster parents but also service workers and that it should be mandatory. It should be, <coughs> we should create affirming experiences for all young people who are coming into foster care. And the training, what, what would you think would be helpful or effective? It's education around these issues. It's education around the fact that um, this is a, a, the identity of this young person and regardless if you if it fits into your value system or not, we should be affirming of everyone's identity, um, primarily because it, it, it helps them move forward in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, if they li live a shame-based life, it's very difficult then to move forward. A lot of um, a lot of difficulties come from shame-based existence, right? We we know that there's exacerbated rates of um, alcoholism and drug use, uh, depression, suicide rates are double to triple uh, within this community. Um, versus the general population. So we know that if we affirm uh, these young people and provide them services and supports um, where they feel safe and secure, like all youth should, uh, that they have a better chance of moving forward. Do we know any numbers about what percentages of people that are in these areas, in these shelters, are affected by this? Sure. So um, out of all homeless youth, 40% identify as LGBT. 40%? And they make up only 8% of the population. So there's a huge disparity wow. there. Yeah, it's a it's a huge issue um, that needs to really, I think, come to the forefront. And I think it's time now. I think you know there's been a great focus on marriage equality, which is very important. Mm -hmm. um, Iowa's done a fantastic job with civil rights. Has a great history with civil rights, and I think this is one area where not only Iowa but all across the country we can do better on supporting uh, our youth. So if somebody picks up this book, what are they going to find in this book? They're going to find uh, personal uh, 
personal narrative. They're going to find it's a memoir uh, primarily, but it's it's I'm not the the fourth. I'm not at the center of the narrative. It's really about the youth and their experiences, and I'm I think we all operate from a place of empathy, and um, so I really try to create a, a stories that tell the story, the nuance, the complexity of these young people, and, um, and so hopefully people will build empathy and then be moved to maybe evoke some change in these young people's now, lives. As it stands now in the foster system, do foster parents have the right to say, we don't want this kid? It's yeah, they do, unfortunately. Um, it's state by state. Some states are doing better than others. In New York, I was doing this work in 2004 to 2006. There were no um, provisions there to, to bar discrimination. There are now. Uh, there are, it's called best practices guidance for LGBT youth. Um, unfortunately, in states, um, Across the country, that's not the case. Um, a foster parent can take in a young person, that young person may identify as LGBT and, 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 and state that, and then that person can then remove that young person. Mm -hmm. So it's another further rejection that the young person has had. They've been rejected from their nuclear family, they then again are rejected from the foster parent, and then they get bounced around. Um, so they yeah. never have a, a chance to build an attachment to a caring, consistent adult in their lives. All right, so what time does your program start today? 7 p.m., and I'm going to be speaking, I think uh, Senator Matt McCoy is going to oh, be yeah? there. Okay, yeah. yeah, he's going to be there. Um, uh, Donna Redwing from uh, One Iowa will be there as well, and there'll be yeah. some service providers from Central Iowa talking about youth homelessness and what's happening here. Uh, everywhere I go around the state, I get people uh, who do this work to come and talk about the unique challenges that their particular community addresses. Well, wonderful. Well, have fun tonight, and hopefully open up a lot of eyes. Later Thank you. That as well. Tell Matt we said hi. I sure will. All Thanks right. so much Thank for having me. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, Ryan Burke, ladies and gentlemen.